Good afternoon, everyone, uh, to all of you on the other side. This is our last uh, presentation of uh, this conference of Beyond Modernity, Alternative Inc Inclusions into the Anthropocene. And we will have the pleasure of hearing uh, Professor Miriam Lang, uh, whose talk I think will dialogue or continue to dialogue with the, our previous panel, which focused on land struggles and socio-ecological resistances in the age of the Anthropocene and where we had the pleasure of hearing some voices from Latin and Central America. Uh, and so uh, Professor Miriam Lang is an Associate Professor for Environmental and Sustainability Studies at Universidad Andina Simón Bolívar in Ecuador. And she holds a PhD in Sociology and a Master's Degree in Latin American Studies from the Free University of Berlin. Uh, she has been collaborating with the Latin American Permanent Working Group on Alternatives to Development. And she's also an activist in internationalist, feminist, decolonial and ecological social movements. And her research focuses reflect also her uh, worries for a more fair world. Uh, she has been focusing on the critique of development, on systemic alternatives and on the territorial implementation of One Be Beach. So to do this, she combines decolonial and feminist perspectives with political economy and political ecology. So I think her work will dialogue very much with the, all the panels that we, we have had and also the keynote uh, uh, talks that uh, we had the pleasure of hearing. Uh, she co-edited uh, a book, which I fully recommend called Beyond Developments, Alternative Visions from Latin America in 2013, which has been translated into nine languages. So can be uh, available for, for different geographies and different populations. And now today at, a, at our conference, she will be discussing her latest book, which I had the pleasure of uh, going through. Uh, the book was published uh, this year. Or, I, I don't know if it has yet been published or it will be published because- Well, we're gonna present it in Kayambe next week. <laughs> Oh. Exactly. So we're, this is a premiere. <laughs> this is, a, uh, we have the pleasure of being one of the first, first people to, to hear about uh, her work, her most recent work. And uh, this book is called Reinhabiting the Territory, Plurinationality, Inter Interculturality and Suma Kausai in the First Indigenous Municipality of Kanbaye. So I give uh, the floor to, to Professor Miriam Lang. Thank you so much for being here with us. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mariana. Thanks a lot, Antonio, for having me in this really interesting conference. I suppose you are all really exhausted. I had the pleasure to listen to a part of it yesterday, to Stefania Barca's talk, which was really interesting. And I'm very happy to be able to share this last moment of reflection with you. Um, what I would like to do is introduce, I, I think you've had lots of uh, talks and interactions also about indigenous modes of living uh, in this conference. And I would like to focus a bit on Buen Vivir or Suma Kausai as it is called in Quichua, the main indigenous language in Ecuador. Uh, because I consider Suma Causa is a pluriversal alternative to this mode of living that capitalist modernity made hegemonic and which precisely has led us to this uh, Anthropocene or how I would call it rather Capitalocene or Androcene predicament we are facing today. And um, I will try to show my perspective on when we were from various case studies I did in different parts of Ecuador of how is this put into practice in the territory. Um, and I would say it's a mode of product producing existence otherwise, to put it in the words of my colleague Catherine Walsh, uh, of producing existence in community. And this works through a range of principles and practices. Buen Vivir exists mainly in indigenous societies, not only in the Andes. I would say it has equivalence, very close equivalence throughout the Americas and even beyond, but it is always very place-based. So we should ac actually talk of Buenos Vivires in plural because it always differs according to context and history. Um, and there is a very strong mechanism to make this invisible as an alternative 
uh, to produce it as non-existent or irrelevant. And this is categorizing its protagonists as poor, as backward, underdeveloped, primitive, or ignorant. Assuming that according to the hegemonic way of framing success and well-being, everybody there dreams of being modern consumers. Um, you might have uh, got in contact with Buen Vivir when it went famous worldwide because it was introduced in Ecuador's and Bolivia's constitutions, respectively in 2008 and 2009, under the governments of Rafael Correa and Evo Morales. But uh, in retrospective, I think we can say that this translation of uh, this mode of production of existence otherwise into a guiding principle for public policies, um, which could be would be implemented from the state in these countries has failed. Um, I have worked on this in other uh, contexts, but just to um, wrap it up, I would say that the inherent logics of the state apparatuses themselves, which are framed toward uh, guaranteeing capitalist accumulation and economic growth quickly absorbed all the antagonistic elements of Buen Vivir and simply reframed it in the official discourse as a synonym to modernization or development or even growth. Uh, also, I would like to point out that by no means Buen Vivir or Suma Causa should be misunderstood as a anti-capitalist ideology Actually, I think it's not anti anything. Uh, it is not a consistent theory which would guide transformation as socialism or anarchism did that in the 19th or 20th centuries. Um, rather, Summa Causa would be a contemporaneous, very place based political project and practice. Um, and we can say that it is a mode of existence that is dysfunctional in practice to the project of capitalist accumulation without necessarily claiming that ideologically. It is dysfunctional to the homogenization of population and to all this contract based ethos of competitive indi individualism that uh, underlies capitalism. Um, what is also important is that it is not uh, something that is residual, that is still there from the past, but that it produces, from my perspective, alternative modes of living in present time. Um, and this is because it is dynamically produced and reproduced through those practices I will now uh, try to uh, share with you through certain structures and certain imaginaries. And uh, so it's also not so much a matter of cultural identity, but of choosing a certain way to reproduce life in the everyday uh, life. And also very important is that the territorial processes of practicing Summa Kausai um, have existed long before, also during and after this attempt to translate it into public policies. Um, and so this is the uh, processes I would like to focus on here. Um, very central for Summa causa is the quality of relations, both between humans and with other forms of life. Um, indigenous people often don't, don't really have speak of nature, but they only speak of the surroundings, which they recognize to be in, interdependent with in the reproduction of their life. And so the, these notions of equilibrium and harmony that we often come about when we read about Buen Vivir are not meant in such a romantic uh, nature enhancing way, but rather pragmatic, as I understand it, uh, just because the interdependence with the surroundings, the natural surroundings uh, evolve around very concrete dimensions of the reproduction of life. 
Um, community in from the perspective of Summa Causa is not only an like let's say administrative feature to manage better some common goods, but it is a, an organizing principle for society as a whole. So when we hear aims at being in community, we could say, and accumulation, be it of wealth or of power, is not only not a goal, but it is also considered a threat and thus deactivated through certain mechanisms of redistribution, for example, of rotation of duties in uh, authority in the community and of reciprocity. And of course, uh, Summa Causa fosters collaboration instead of competition. So that said, actually, I'm not going to um, try to resume my last book here, but I'm trying to take up a question that comes up at the end of the book, because I hope you're going to read the book. So I just want to raise your interest about uh, one set of questions that uh, yeah, began to um, come to my mind when I ended this work. And this is if alternative modes of living persist at the margins and not really outside of capitalist modernity, how then do they interact with it without being completely absorbed by it? How are the elements of the modern world incorporated, transformed or rejected by actors or communities that practice summa causa? Um, so what, what about this boundary between the modern world and the summa causa world, the alternative? How does it work? Yeah, how do they intersect or interact? How can we as researchers who explore alternatives avoid to reenact ourselves dichotomic worldviews only the other way around by trying to make visible how different the other is, uh, how can we avoid constructing dualisms by insisting in only making this otherness visible? And a question I posed myself was, if exploring the relations between those alternative modes of, alternative modes of living like Summa Causa and the hegemonic ones could maybe help us to build narratives to which urban, western, or mestizo people who definitely do not live in a rural indigenous village, for example, can relate in an easier way. So um, what I did was uh, an ethnographic approach to the uh, county of Kayambe to explore how they enact ecologies of practices across the heterogeneously entangled worlds between Summa Causa and the hegemonic modern uh, society of Ecuador. And I'm uh, here borrowing these terms from Marisol de la Cadena and Mario Blaser. So um, the case study which I am grounding this on is of course uh, the locality of Cayambe County in the Northern Ecuadorian Andes, which is uh, an overlapping uh, space which with the Cayambe ancestral territory, which is actually wider and goes into other counties and pr provinces, but it, uh, it's also there. And uh, Cayambe is considered the cradle of Ecuador's indigenous movement since the 1930s and 40s, where there were strong struggles from the first peasant um, unions, indigenous peasant unions, which were claiming the right to indigenous education, education and had clandestine schools. And in these struggles, they um, weaved some bonds with the emerging socialist and communist parties back then. Um, so it's a very symbolic place in Ecuador, which until present time still has strong indigenous organizations. And now, uh, recently, uh, six years ago now, for the first time in history, one um, protagonist of this indigenous movement, Guillermo Churuchumbi, won the elections to mayor in the municipality of Cayambe. Um, 
so that was the starting point of a collective attempt to build Summa Kausai now in cooperation between social organizations in the county and the local government. Um, putting somehow the state at the service of the political goals of the people in the county. This is because Guillermo Churuchumbi had been the leader of the indigenous movement there and he came from that history. When he was mayor, he had a different perspective on things. Actually, his uh, candidacy was asked of him by his organization. And they emitted a first ordinance to declare the municipality plurinational, intercultural, and uh, uh, aiming at Summa Kausai. So that set the grounds for all the following. Uh, this is a picture of Guillermo Turutumbi and of one very important woman activist in the county, Mama Hilda. Um, who is at, in the women's movement and also in the indigenous organization. And she's also an agroecological producer. Here you have a map where uh, Pichincha province is located and within the province, Kayambe County would be this. And uh, just uh, to have a quick picture, um, Kayambe is traditionally uh, focused on agricultural production and in the last decades since neoliberalism, it has been linked to the world market by uh, mainly dairy production, there is a branch of Nestle there, and also intensive flour production for export. Um, so yeah, and I think you have seen the other data. Here is the volcano Kayambe, which is the third highest in Ecuador, almost 6,000 meters, and the city of Kayambe. Um, and what is important to state is that in this building of Summa Kausai in the county, uh, many actors have intervened, are working somehow together in synergy. Uh, this ranges from the Confederation of Kayambi people, which would be the classical indigenous territorial organization, um, which is part of the national indigenous movement and is a sort of self-government structure for this indigenous territory, which is uh, depicted here on this map, and it's bigger than the country, as you can see. Um, then there are the first grade organizations, which are like branches of this bigger Kayambi organization, which are the little colored dots here. Then there are community governments. And then we have other kinds of social organizations, like, for example, the county's women's movement or the organization of the agroecological agro producers or new neighborhood committees, which have come up in the city. Um, and we have official participation structures, which are constitutionally uh, due, like a county assembly and, of course, the municipality itself. So this whole process started with a set of self-determined surveys, which included uh, studies and needs assessments in assemblies and were very much framed by these uh, yeah, I, I would say Kayambi activists to a certain extent and their mestizo allies, which wanted to transform the county in a more just place, in a more um, sustainable place, and intervened in designing these uh, studies. And very important for this was that once the indigenous for the first time came to inhabit the structure of local gov government, they also uh, transformed the way of doing politics and of understanding the relation of this local state with society. Um, two examples of this. For one, um, I think there was a very strong emphasis on strengthening assembly-based decision-making um, taking participatory budgeting very seriously, calling in assemblies, for example, of all the urban population to make a very difficult decision, uh, transforming audiences with the mayor, with which before were a personal appointment into public 
audiences themselves where everything that is said is transparent for everybody. Um, so democracy has been deepened in this way and people have been pushed toward self-determination in this assemblyarian mode of collective decision-making. Um, and this led to a different understanding of the local government itself, which didn't uh, see itself anymore as a service provider for the people, but as a partner of the people in a reciprocal relation. Uh, I think this becomes most visible in uh, the way of framing public works, which in the colonial political culture, which is rather common here in Ecuador, many times is uh, understood as a personal gift of the, the elected uh, mandatory um, to the people, to a certain group of people. But now people were confronted with the choice to have a normal public work, which will be executed as a service by the, the municipality, or have a co-managed public work, which would mean that they decide the design, they decide what they need, and they collaborate the people themselves which receive this public work in its uh, implementation or construction. And this was drawing on the tradition of unpaid community labor of Minga in the Quechua language, which was by this means extended also into urban contexts. And so um, people were encouraged first to gather, to organize, to take a collective decision about what they wanted. So that fostered also relation building also in the urban neighborhoods. And they were uh, pushed toward collective ownership of these public works because they had worked on them with their hands and towards more autonomy because they could manage the system they had built, for example. And of course, uh, the municipal budgets are rather limited in Ecuador, especially since the economic crisis, which started in 2014. And so much more works can be achieved under this uh, co-management formula because it allows to um, only spend like 30% less in the price because the contractor doesn't get all the money. So there are some examples of that in the context of the city. This is an urban park being reaccommodated. And there are some pictures of assemblies. And then another instrument which was very important for this process of change was the use of municipal ordinances, which uh, made structural change possible to a certain extent and could give it durability also. So the first ordinance, very important in this case, was the one that uh, reformed the property tax at the local level, uh, according to the motto, who owns more pays more. And that was understood as a measure to reduce inequality in a relative way. Um, and then there were two examples which I find very interesting of ordinances drafted by popular women's organizations, uh, both by agricultural producers and the county's women's movement. This is one ordinance to promote agroecological production and consumption, and one other to prevent and eradicate violence against women. So in this case, it was the women themselves who came up with the project and who pushed for the project to go through all the instances in the municipality until it was passed by the city council. And of course, those women also own their uh, laws. They made themselves and are now um, pendant of their implementation. So here we can see some of these women in agricultural. This is Mama Hilda again in her agroecological parcel, a march of the women's movement and a group of agroecological producers with the mayor. Um, and the third 
dimension of um, strategy, I would say, uh, to toward Buen Vivir is using uh, the tools of plurinationality and interculturality themselves in order to get to a territory where different actors share the authority. So uh, plurinationality is about the respect of the authority of indigenous self-government in indigenous territories. Um, which was constitutionalized in 2008, but in the overall society, racism and discrimination persist, especially in the media and also throughout the state. So there has not been much progress in legislation to harmonize how different powers, like the power of indigenous self-government and the power of the modern state would really collaborate. This has become evident especially around the issue of indigenous justice or communitarian justice, which is often practiced in many places of Ecuador, but is very often disrecognized or um, defamated by the media, for example, as lynching or something like that. Um, in Kayanga, this is different because the local government under the, this, in this new, uh, administrative period came to respect indigenous justice and its decisions, but also uh, indigenous justice has undergone a process of strengthening by the indigenous organizations in a process of collective discussion and formation on the weekends. And it has been used as a tool for transformation. I would like to make that clear in some examples. Um, it's not only applied in conflict resolution in the communities, which would be the equivalent to panel law, but also, for example, in the land registry of the municipality, uh, resolutions of indigenous justice in community assemblies uh, declaring certain pieces of land as collective property are legalized by the land registry. So this allows for uh, an official title of collective property, which then makes possible to build some infrastructure on these lands. Um, and it, I think we can see at the, in the example of Kayambe that indigenous justice compared to the whole uh, process of the modern state is a rather agile tool, which allows, for example, to implement new rules effectively in uh, territory, while, for example, to pass a law in the Western uh, system, this can be a rather lengthy process and you don't have really the guarantee that this law will effectively be implemented. Um, of course, there are also problems, but we can maybe discuss that later. So I would like to make this clear with one example, how indigenous justice can contribute to uh, transformation toward, for example, better relations with nature. There is a very long history of what, uh, water inequality and water conflicts in Cayambe, because first the haciendas were monopolizing it and now it's the flower plants. And um, so there was one very clear need of democratizing the access to clean drinking water and also to uh, water for irrigation. And there we can see the interaction of different actors, the confederation of the Kayambi people, the indigenous territorial organization emitted a law on its own declaring this, it, its whole territory a water reserve. This, this means they enacted con their constitutionally granted indigenous rights to jurisdiction, although this is not very common here in Ecuador, but then they could, they had a, a base to implement this in all the Kayambi communities and to discuss zonal delimitations to where the cattle could go and where agriculture could advance into the highlands or not and uh, to implement systems of effective protection against wildfires, 
they set up a system of uh, guards that patrol the paramos. There's more than 100 guards who are walking around detecting wildfires early or detecting hunters who shouldn't be there, for example. And they can implement community justice or indigenous justice sanctions for the infractors of that. And at the same time, the municipality um, on its side builds water treatment plans uh, with public funds and build sewage systems, of course, many times in Minga with community work to guarantee uh, that this water with, which has then been cared for in the highlands where it is stored can be distributed safely to all. Uh, and there is also a newer project, which is a reciprocity water fund, again, to reduce inequalities, where highland communities are compensated by the main water consumers, which are located lower. So these are some pictures from the highlands and a water plant here, and those uh, paramo guards, which are patrolling uh, the highlands. So um, to come to a sort of conclusion, um, of course, nowadays, Kayambi still is a county that is inserted in capitalist dynamics. It is still determined by them in many ways. And agribusiness is still there. Racism is still there. Patriarchy is still there. But at the same time, we can observe multiple actors which cooperate to produce a new kind of territoriality where power relations are uh, changed, are dismantled progressively, and new forms of coexistence are built. Um, and what caught my attention is that in many cases, uh, regarding the role of the state in transformation, uh, it comes out that the merit of the municipality consisted not in actually do, doing things itself, but rather in allowing others to do them, in ensuring that the organized society, the grassroots actors would find the best possible conditions regarding regulations to be able to advance toward their own objectives. Um, another very important aspect is the base of knowledge that underlies a transformative process. And we can see in Kayambe that decision-making is oriented both by modern scientific, scientific surveys and studies, which uh, rely on all sorts of agreements with universities and other institutions, also of the central state, but which are always co-designed in their indicators, in the questions they ask, by the local actors, by indigenous actors many times to suit the context. Um, and there is a general process of reevaluating and reconstructing indigenous knowledges, of documenting them uh, from the confederation of the Kayambi people, uh, which are trying to make public policy proposals on the basis of these indig indigenous knowledges. Um, and this, the interesting point here is that this ancestral knowledge is not just conserved, so to have it, but it is really put into circulation in this protest. It is put into synergies with those other knowledges to solve concrete problems. So we could say that there is the generation of an intercultural base of knowledge very specific to the local context, to the local needs, and it is at the same time highly dynamic and suitable for this kind of place-based political transformation. Also, what is interesting to connect with my initial questions are the various modes to engage with the structures of the modern colonial state, of course, always at the local level. Um, we can observe that where this is considered helpful, its instruments are used, like in all the tax reforms and tax incentives, also through the ordinances, 
Uh, but in other aspects, the competences and possibilities of the very institutions are extended or modified somehow. For example, in the case of the land registry, uh, when it started legalizing, legalizing community lands and recognizing assembly decisions uh, to that purpose, then we can see that, of course, uh, the, the monopoly of force inherent to the modern state is also challenged in Kayambi. For example, when the confederation of the Kayambi people emits or implements legislation of its own. Of course, this is not illegal, but it is not common, yeah, because it's constitutionalized. And we can see that plurinationality, which is put to practice with the legal pluralism in Kayambe, also, of course, challenges this ideal of a homogeneous modern nation state. So uh, in some, there is a fluid and creative transition between using some instruments of the state, questioning it on other levels, and effectively transforming it where this is possible. And I think a condition for this to be able to happen is that the, uh, power, the, the, re the power relations at the local level are uh, very much determined by the strength and the activity of local social organizations. Yeah. And this is what, ha what had lacked at the national level when uh, the constitutionalization of Buen Vivir gave way to a demobilization of social movements and it was left to the hands of the state. We have uh, still uh, this historical alliance between certain indigenous contents and leftist struggles is still alive today and it also led people to incorporate certain uh, horizons of modernity that came to exist because of former social struggles, like the whole reference to equality, to social justice, as well as the framework of human rights and democracy itself. But at the same time, there is a challenge to the liberal individualist notion of democracy and to the centrality that it gives in its uh, hegemonic way of existence to private property when there is this emphasis on collective rights, collective political subjects and communitarian property, and also the creation of new commons, of course, like the community care of the paramos or certain certification systems in agroecological production, which decommodify the practice of certification. So this would confirm this hypothesis of the dysfunctionality of summa causa for capitalism. So to come to an end, when we were asking about how elements of the modern world are incorporated, transformed or rejected by the protagonists of summa causa in Kayambe. And um, we could say that the transformation strategies of these actors have generated their own underlying base of knowledge, which includes includes contributions both from science and technology as well as ancestral knowledge and assesses needs collectively in a self-determined manner. They include emancipatory legacies of Western modernity um, and make use of local state institutions when they find them suitable for their goals. But the strength and constant involvement of social organizations is what guarantees a favorable balance of power, which allows for these local institutions to change to a certain extent. And which is also very important is the collective self-determinations, self-determination about which elements of modernity are to be incorporated and which not. This is decisive, I think, in the way summa causae coexists and persists in the modern world. <laughs>